After a film like this, one really wants to be silent for a while. <laughs> but uh, I know I don't have that option. <coughs> what should I say? Let me start by dredging a little bit of your personal history. There was a lot of it in the film, but a little more. Your life seems to be, um, you know, a lot of your writing, that is, seems to emanate from your struggle with patriarchy. Um, that continues to gaslight most of us women, even today, in this age of uh, neo-patriarchy or patriarchy. I think terms like patriarchy, in any case, are the oversimplification of a very, very complex reality and um, too blunt and monolithic, really, to capture the nuances of uh, the insidious ways in which they work. Mm, there was a social, I'm sure you know about Max Weber, the social theorist and political economist. He said that the very longevity of patriarchy is an indication of how inviolable it is. <laughs> and then I am suddenly remembering something from the book of Laughter and Forgetting, Milan Kundera's, where he says the struggle of man, or I would like to add woman against power, is actually the struggle of memory against forgetting. I think this is so beautiful, especially in the context of your life. Um, I read your book, that Speaking Tiger, just, um, you know, the translated version of your original autobiography is written in Punjabi, Kura Kabara and Khana Badosh. I read Weaving Water and let it wash over me slowly. It was such an amazing book. You have been in actually engaging with memory most of your life in different ways. And um, I know I'm quoting too many authors, but just allow me this one indulgence. T.S. Eliot, you know, said in the context of poetry, not, not really in the context of prose, but in the context of poetry, that um, writing is not an expression of self, but it is an escape from self. <laughs> so I think it's both. It's a little bit of both. Um, now I'm going to ask you once more to defreeze some of your childhood memories and talk about your young days in pre-partition Lahore. I was also thinking that you would ask me about partition. <laughs> I, one uh, article of mine about partition has just been published in Indian literature. It is brought out by Spice Academy. Uh, and I'm so amazed every year when we celebrate our independence. Celebrate our independence. Mm -hmm. They never ever mentioned the torture that we had to accept and go through during partition. Independence also means a million people killed, 10 million uprooted, <coughs> homeless, wandering when and if we got independent. My, about my childhood memories relating to partition, perhaps <coughs> in a different way. In, uh, on every railway station, there were two huge tanks of water, steel tanks, shining silver gray, on which in bold black letters, in Gurmukhi and in Urdu, was written Hindu Pani, Muslim Pani. The two 
tagged on every railway station, declaring one tag as Hindu Pani, the other tag as Musliman Pani. Not Muslim, Musliman. I clearly remember. The other memory which comes to my mind is that my grandmother, who we called Babiji, always used to take, a, take me to Nankana Sahib on every Sangrad, that is the beginning of the month. And she cooked beautiful, delicious paratha and aluki sabri. I went mostly for the paratha and aluki sabri. <laughs> Rather than seeing that kind of stuff, which I had seen anyway. So we were traveling in the train, and a woman in white burka. The burkas were huge at that time. I think they must be spend, must be spending 10-15 jars of cloth to make a burka. She wrote it to my grandmother and said, Me to Jasoda? Is your name Jasoda? And my grandmother said, Yes, I am your Jasoda. And who are you? I think you are Noora, aren't you? <laughs> they were childhood friends. They had played together. They had uh, I lived their childhood together in a village. And they had come across each other when they were grandmothers. My nanny was carrying her grandchild along. She was alone. So both of them hugged each other, wept a little, wiped their tears, and uh, sat talking. So I said, please, uh, my grandmother has forgotten about the paratha and the <laughs> So I tucked at her dupatta and I said, Tabiji, cook like ye. I am hungry. So my grandmother said, yes, of course. And she, I mean, without feeling any shame about this or any, any regret about this, she said, just move away. This little girl has to eat her roti. And she didn't mind. She smiled and said, yes, of course. roti And that was the, that is the memory which I can never forget. Both of them accepted it as normal behavior. And Noora accepted it as it had to be like that. No regret. After I had my roti, they again came together and started talking as before. The third memory which stands out is when I started my seventh class, which was a few months before partition. Uh, it was a girls' school, of course. Being the hall, it had to be a girls' school. Uh, so they started cooking classes. These girls are growing up. They have to look after their home. They have to cook also. So cooking classes. So they made groups of four girls who cooked for uh, four or five hours and then teachers then teachers came and they tasted and gave marks. So in the whole of class of 40 girls, there was one Muslim girl, Kishwar. Nobody would take her in the group. She was sitting there uh, almost, uh, uh, she was 
almost cried. They said, Kishwan, never mind. Both of us will form, form a group. Let them go to hell. We will cook together. So we used to cook. Kishwan and I, and nobody tasted our food because it was prepared by a Muslim girl. No teacher tasted our food. That was good for us because we had our hearty meal. <laughs> but it had not to be divulged to my parents. I never told them that I have cooked the food with Kishwar as my companion. Mm. Another memory is of my Payadi, my Nandaji, my grandfather. He had a very close friend called Haji Sahib. So Haji Sahib sometimes took him home to have biryani. So my grandfather took me along with a solemn promise that I will not divulge this to my grandmother. So we went to Hadisa's place, had a good time, delicious biryani and whatnot. And uh, he also served uh, yellow colored uh, sweet rice. Zardar. I don't know what is what is called. Zarda, Zarda. And we enjoyed it and never uttered a word about it to my grandmother or to my mother, to anybody, it was a secret between Haji Sahar and my grandfather and me. <laughs> what a nice thing. <laughs> so these are a few memories of my childhood which stand out. Um, can I scratch another memory? Um, this is just after partition was announced too. First of all, the night, uh, the night of August 14 and 15. Um, you saw your father, he probably didn't sleep because nobody would sleep those days. They remained glued to the radio. In the morning, you suddenly found that his hair had turned white overnight. And um, the day, the night, when everybody was celebrating independence, that day was the day of catastrophe. For all the Punjabis whose homes are left behind. Uh, uh, my father and mother made us sleep, me and my little brother, and they were due to the radio. When we got up, my mother was crying, and my father's eyes were dark red with suppressed tears because men don't cry. They suppress their tears. And we found that the father who we left due to the radio at night had black beard. When we got up in the morning, his beard had gone gray. And the whole day we were crying because he said, I'm going to Lahore because my grandparents are there. And my mother was crying. We were crying. We were trying to hold him back. He said, no, I have to go. And that was the day, our Independence Day, was the doomsday for not only us, for many, many others. A million died, 10 million rendered homeless. Let us remember them when we give lectures from the Red Fort. <laughs> um, I'm sure a lot of you know this poem by Fez. Achati Hongi Subhe Azadi, Ye Dag Dag Ujala, Wo Intazar Tha Jiska, Wo Ye Hair To Nahi. This tainted blemish dawn, this is not the dawn we ached for. Somehow your father and your mother thought that they would, you know, that Lahore would be retained with India. They kept, you know, they were optimistic. And strangely, you know, I was in the partition museum 
there's a uh, there's a um, interview there's a little film where Kuldeep Nair is interviewing Cyril Radcliffe and Cyril Radcliffe says that he was almost giving Lahore to India but then realized that Pakistan did not really have any big city so he decided that Pakistan that Lahore would go to Pakistan but coming back to your father's story I also want to say that after partition there were profound affinities you know beyond borders and your father uh, when he went back to get his parents and parent-in-laws uh, his friend Dr. Yusuf I think oh, that I was his name yeah he helped him he was the one who went to the besieged house and brought the Guru Granth Sahib wrapped in a green cloth that he probably used for wrapping the Quran. Quran. Tell us about it and Alpana, I know that you don't, you, Alpana made me promise that I wouldn't make her speak too much today. But I'm remembering that beautiful painting that you've made, you know, with your grandfather bent, bent quite a bit actually carrying a cloud-like sack on his back. And one wonders what that sack is. It's obviously a sack of memories. memories. A yeah. sack also of probably trepidation. A sack perhaps of hope. Would you like to talk a little about it? Actually, when India turned 50, I felt I had to remember my grandfather. I had to remember Bhagat Singh and Uttam Singh. And uh, all my childhood dreams were haunted, so I painted Bhagat Singh and Basanti Chola, and I painted Uddam Singh and, uh, and, Gandhi. and Gandhi. And in one painting, Train to Pakistan, I yes. read several times Kushant Uncle, Train yeah. to Pakistan. This, this crossing, the crossing your characters. And yeah. Gandhi and Bhagat Singh are merging into one because their dreams were one in spite of uh, opposite ideologies. Mm -hmm. So these were the partition paintings. And my mother also told me about her grandfather who would not leave the railway station. He was the last Sikh to leave Gujramala railway station. And he was serving Langar there. He said, I'm not going to leave till the last Hindu or Sikh has left. And he risked his life. And they were waiting anxiously for him here. So there's stories of courage that, you know. And I remember our teacher, Professor Ramachandra Gandhi, who said that we never atoned for the dead during the partition. And if we had apologized to each other, both sides had apologized to each other, some of the wounds would have been healed. So, thank you, Sujata, but also, Orun for enabling us to see for the first time this film that was made before COVID. Yeah, I so we saw it for the first time. Thank oh, you. Oh, really? Yeah. Wasn't Dr. Rao here from Science Academy as he left? Yeah. Oh, there he is. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Thanks. Dr. Rao is there? Yeah, he's there. <laughs> Thank you for the film, Dr. Rao. Thank you. Dr. Rao, may I post? Are they retired, Dina? Are they retired? I want to ask you a lighter question. Is it true that you gave yourself uh, your name when you were 15? My mother always said that I don't want to impose a religion or a name because the Sikh name, she is Ajit Kaur, my carpenter Ajit Singh, and Manjit Kaur, Paramjit Singh, Ajit <laughs> Kaur. So she said, you choose your own name. And my first choice was Amrita because I was a great fan. Then I said, no, everybody laughed at me for emulating her name. And I said to mommy, she said, call yourself Mary, Fatima, whatever. <laughs> and I explained. So I thought of Alpana for some reason, like to men's uh, offering, so it's from the Granth also. So Mami said, anything Mary Fatima Alpana will do. <laughs> Let me elaborate. <laughs> I never gave her a name. My mother insisted and insisted, I said, no. She'd select her own name and her own religion. 
I'm not going to expose anything on her. You have exposed things on me enough. <laughs> enough is enough. <laughs> now it is my day. Mommy <laughs> <laughs> was married at 16. Anyway, so I said, I called, my mother called her daddy. She was so little. Uh, found it uh, spring day of school. She came to her house, picked her up. She was hardly two and a half. And she said, I'm opening a school and I need children. You are a friend, so I'm taking her. I said, she is only two and a half. So I will look after her. I have got an ayah who will look after the children. So she opened the school in her own house. And she said, what name? I said, Dolly. She said, Me, uh, I mean, uh, you should uh, uh, have a proper name for her. I said, this is the name. Did she select her own name? So in spring day of school, she was Dolly. Then in ladies in school, she was Dolly. After much fight with the principal. Then she was admitted to Auckland Shimla. And Mrs. Hakeem fought with me. No, she must have a proper name. I said, till she selects her proper name, I am not going to expose her name. She was Dolly. The day she had to fill her, her senior cabinet form, she rang me up. Now Mrs. Hakeem says, you have to have a proper name to fill in the form. Select one. Then she selected Alpana herself, and I approved. <laughs> that was what I approved. <laughs> I have a follow-up question on that. Uh, you became a senator. I'm curious about you know, someone so illustrious in her practice and what that process might have been to teaching yourself. Um, you know, I always was my mother's shadow. So I thought that I should, the way she was teaching to raise up two little girls, there was never a father in her lives. So I thought, let me take over the burden, I'll become a teacher and I will let mommy rest. So I then in 1979, while I was studying literature, I had my first uh, group show and first solo while I was studying. And then uh, Susan's wife was here, Maria. the first wife, Maria. She had a gallery called Arts 38 in London. So she mm -hmm. said, uh, you know, I'll show you in my Arts 38 and get you a scholarship in St. Martin. So Mommy would accompany me everywhere. Maria had a six-floor house. She lived alone because Susa had abandoned her for the third wife. So, um, mommy left me there with her. I had an advanced course of painting scholarship through Maria in St. Martin's. And I was so shy, I couldn't even walk into a cafe and ask for a cup of tea or cross the road and lift my eyes. And I missed my mother and everything about this land of ours. So, m mother would fire me that there's nothing in Delhi. There were no avenues for artists. There were just two galleries. And in London, there were 400. And Maria would fire me. You need a foreign stamp. Susa has a foreign stamp. Everybody has a foreign stamp. Can I just interrupt with an interesting anecdote? Your solo exhibition, I'm reminded of that in 70. Five, 70, 75, where there would be one person visiting it every day. So your friends would laughingly say that it is indeed a soul. So <laughs> <laughs> and, and you, I think it's just out of, uh, you know, whatever, frustration or whatever. You made a whole series called No Audience. Missing Audience. Missing Audience. Missing audience. Where he's uh, singing to himself on a harmonium with Joe's guys. And uh, we're in great ecstasy, and there are empty chairs. Or he's listening to himself, he's standing behind the chairs, and he's the only audience. Because only one person would walk into the gallery per day, and I would be looking at the door, 
and they would say, when is your next solo show? So this 79 scholarship, I mean, I was missing her so much that in spite of all the firing from Maria and Mami, <laughs> I dropped the advanced course of painting uh, course and came back. And that's it. But then, back yeah, into my lab. And she should follow up, you know, you should tell, tell us what happened after that. Because you, soon after you had your exhibition at the Jahangir Art Gallery, that was completely sold out. And uh, I think uh, Emmett was saying, he bought three paintings, isn't it? Two or three paintings. He bought one on the rape of Maya Gabi. And then the rest of them were bought by a lot of these corporate groups like Godridge and Tata. G. Actually, the uh, Maya Tyagi work was, um, you know, there were, I didn't know it could land up eventually after Sensa's death. I had a solo in Bangalore. And on the way to the airport, I told my childhood friend, I want to see the Hussein Museum. So, this work of 1979, where the three policemen are standing over the raped woman and her clothes have become the flag. <coughs> Uh, she's without clothes. It was a six foot canvas. I always painted very large. There were no sales in those days. In the first solo, only one eight foot painting sold for 800 rupees. And this in 1980 was a surprise because, um, you know, we didn't know anybody in Bombay. We were staying in the YWC. A whole night we stretched canvases. There were 20 of them, we carried them on, on How did you carry them? Yeah, in a roll on the train. Mm -hmm. And the stretchers were under the seats. So everybody who stumbled on them was scolding us, you know, in the night. <laughs> so Jahangir Gadli was available only at night. So whole night we stretched and stayed in YWCA, uh, went for breakfast, came back, and Mrs. Menon, who was in charge, who was still there, was grinning from year to year. She said, look who's here. With Hussein Sa was photographing the works, and uh, uh, the press was very kind, although the series was very difficult. But Bombay had a huge Parsi uh, collector base who never went for names. And I think they bought the young artists without caring who they were. It was great, all the cottages, Jahangir Nicholson, Dubashes. So most artists from Delhi uh, and Calcutta, Calcutta had no buyers, Delhi had no buyers, Delhi had only two galleries then. Dhumiman, uh, then Black Partridge which later became Art Heritage and then Kumar came up, three galleries. So now it's the art capital of the country. So um, I mean that was a big turning point because it was totally unexpected and we were called for, you know, tea and lunch by the press because Kushwant Ankar had Ranga, one or two people, and they came, wrote, and invited us for meals. So it was a very big surprise for us. But even your solo show in Delhi that we were talking about, the missing audience one, it had really good reviews, uh, you know, people like Kesha Malik, yeah. such an art scholar, mm -hmm. such a... Um, Canossia. He had very nice words for it. And before that, let's, if when, when we are tracing the linear trajectory, we must talk about 1974, when Hussein was curating an exhibition in Triveni. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you sent a few paintings. I said, I think you sent three paintings. Okay. And you were so surprised. You were so memory. Sometimes a little bit of research also. <laughs> it's not just that. Yeah, but you know, even now, I'm highly critical out of every 10 paintings I do. I think one I class as A, five, six as B, and there are C's also. <laughs> and down the years, then I take a scissor and cut apart the C's so they should not outlive me. <laughs> so, and my mother, you know, when I began to sell the Indian art market, began in between there were very difficult series like the 1984 massacre mm -hmm. which Mr. Al Ghazi showed very courageously in 1985 and uh, 
there were no sales from that series it was written about what goes, goes on what goes on so one work he acquired one was bought by mgm and then there was widows of rendavan because i got 87 that series 87 i went only to see sculpture in mathura museum i thought it's affected 10000 shaven widows so these were difficult series uh, there were good write ups by keshav and that was when newspapers had art columns mm-hmm. the times of india had print hd had just it had one of the best yes, art columns it was called yeah. and so everybody had uh, you know every newspaper unlike the page 3 that we have today and we never even had to give a cup of tea to a critic never they came quietly like take in a european the sometimes they just saw and they wrote mm-hmm. and now of course there are pr agencies which galleries pay a lakh two lakhs you know and uh, then the page three culture has come it was very different in our times very different yeah i'd like to go back to ajit appa i want to uh, i everyone must have seen this painting this is from the time series and i asked her to to explain this and she said this is bent time this is her mother who's actually bending bending time you know surmounting all the difficulties and the hardships so getting back to your life i'm so sorry to be bridging up all these memories but i definitely do want to talk about your marriage because you said something that really <laughs> that i found so quirky and um, you know i can't say funny but quirky yes You said that it's stupidity to find love in a marriage. Please elaborate that. <laughs> But there are aberrations also. <laughs> like you are. <laughs> there are aberrations. And Savita who is sitting here, his husband Pankaj used to love her so much. And he looked up at the house, the children, and she went beating or whatever. <laughs> she passed away at first night. So there are other reasons. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> You're quite skeptical of romantic love, also, and you remind me so much of um, you know Kate Millett. Sexual politics was one of our Bibles. We all fancied ourselves like. you know we all her favorite feminists of the era so she says that romantic love is actually a means of manipulating a woman and uh, you know cursing her to a lifetime of servitude they i didn't know romantic love is is is, is just a means of emotional manipulation so that you subjugate the woman to a lifetime of servitude and colonize her consciousness completely it is to <laughs> it is how to how much to really i mean i love you mean you cook for me you look after me i am a child you are my mother you are eternally a child yes you are my mother look after me you know I want to ask Apna actually Apna <clears throat> because a lot of your work um, is preoccupied with the predicament of women. Um, uh, you've been called a feminist or a you know, woman painter. And what do you have to say about that? Sometimes I think on the interiorized life of women. Yeah, that was back in uh, 1882. But I really like your embroidering life. I love that because embroidered, embroidered, embroidered. It was in twenty, yeah. It's prakriti, which is prakriti mm-hmm. embroidering, like you know, um, people who came to interview always uh, like slots, like women artists, feminists, and all that. And uh, my themes have been beyond that. The woman angle is bound to come because I've seen the bravest woman. on earth here the bravest woman that i've ever seen is her mm. but uh, you know there are 
uh, when Delhi began to change, I remember I started my environment series in 88. And it was not just rubbing a brush on the canvas, but uh, when these 8,900 trees were cut on City Fort Road, Mani and I went to court against the Delhi government. And we went uh, for eight years and we won the case. And normally trees are replanted um, 22 kilometers away where they don't survive. So here, 2,500 were replanted and they survived and there are peacocks back in the trees. Similarly with monuments I've seen, so a lot of my work has to do with environment. Then having been brought up on uh, Nana Farid, Kabir, Gulisha, there was a whole series on Kabir done 30 years ago, what is just a garment, the Nanak series and uh, of Farid course, also. Farid, Farid also, and the 1984 massacre series is not a feminist series because these decisions are taken by men. My Hiroshima, you know, tears for Hiroshima. Yeah, and uh, then a lot of public murals that I did, which are totally non-commercial in Delhi, Bombay, and a few other cities, which were to do then, about environment and Germany, they were all on the issue. It's a major concern. And even now, we are in the court since 20 years for a public park in our area, which is being grabbed by a, a Jankar Banquets, uh, which has weddings there. It's the most uh, expensive wedding venue in Delhi. So since 20 years ago, I've been a lot in the Green Tribunal because now mommy is unable to go and he has suitcases of money which he takes to places and gets his place unsealed. Then we go to Bure Lalji and have it sealed again. <laughs> so the game, the ping pong is going on between. So uh, the canvases have also, and my favorite series is uh, Time, Day and Night. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I've been painting for 25 years, a yellow woman embroidering the thread of life and a black one with scissors cutting it. Um, What's scissors? Scissors. scissors. 30 scissors. years of yeah. love. Yeah. You know, yeah. strange love affair with scissors. And so Deesh yeah. Kutral apparently used to call you Kenji. Kenji. <laughs> then uh, Malika <laughs> Sarabhai in an interview said, no, I don't like the word Kenji. I'll call you Dhaka. He said, yes. I much prefer yes. that. <laughs> so, I wanted to make a series of posters based on painting to furnish this. So she got various artists uh, make paintings uh, about their state, about India. She asked Alpra to make two paintings. One of them was Kabir weaving. But what comes out of the loom is not cloth, it is water. Water, weaving water. Mm -hmm. So there that we said these have to be inaugurated by Atanji. I mean, this puny little girl, yes. how she behaved so bravely, that is the story. She inherited. So, uh, inherited. <laughs> <laughs> so, we went to Atalji's house. Uh, there was an auditorium outside. And there, uh, gave a little lecture. Then Atalji gave a little lecture. And they said, the painter will now say something. The painter's got up with shaking legs, obviously, <laughs> went to the mic, went to the stage, held a mic and said, Kabirji is trying to weave cloth, but what is coming out of it is water. Because after what happened in Gujarat, nothing else could come out. Yeah. And she went on and dwelled quite deeply on the issue of Gujarat. And at least he sat like this <laughs> with his hand, hand hanging. Yeah. So after that, there was tea. I said, at least this was my daughter. 
और किसी के हो ही नहीं सकती Metaphor of this is a. It's been twenty-five, thirty yeah. years, and it's time. Yeah. You know, like they say, the Greeks and mm. Carl comes and cuts your dollar from here. Mm. So this issue of time, timelessness, mm. and even this bending time, which mm. I've seen her bending time. The times were against her. We had a very dark childhood, very very dark, because a childhood without a male member, without a father, and all that. But then, what emerged from that struggle is unbelievable. The center that she's made. Incidentally, I was against her building the center, so I never participated. In retrospect, I feel that I could have, but I said, "Mommy, it's too big a thing for you to take on as a writer." And she said, "No, I have to do the school in my sister's memory." And then. Uh, you know, it's now got these three, three museums of miniatures. Oh God! And she said, "I want your paintings housed somewhere, you know, forever after we are gone." And uh, people find it hard to build two rooms. So there's this whole center. So this bending time or the, the time series is about and the time. Yeah, the time. You also worked a lot with uh, folk artists. Indigenous artists, gold, Madhubani, Can you tell us a little about that experience and yeah. what that creation process might be like? Um, another related question about how your art is located. You know, if I may use the word within, somewhat within the miniature tradition. There's a lot. That you learned from the Persian, the Pahari miniatures, you know, images within an image, uh, tigers and uh, deer leaping across your canvas. Tell us a little about that. The emotive use of colors. One has always uh, thought that we are lucky to have this five thousand year old tradition flowing in our veins, you know, and uh, totally it's mesmerizing. All our old sculptures and uh, miniature paintings, where Western perspective is totally ignored. If uh, you know something is like the king is uh, in the background and the courtiers are here, the king will be still larger. And the architecture of the Punjab here miniatures, where the fourth wall is dramatically removed, and you can see outside and inside at the same time. And the use of color, which is like gems, you know, yeah. and um, So there are various things, and surrealism in our sculpture, like many armed, you know, goddess, many armed Devi. So, a um, lot of things to be inspired by. And another was folk art, because Mommy always said, by accident or birth, they are born in a village without light. You are born in the capital of the country, and thirty, forty years ago, one could buy a folk painting. For two hundred rupees, three hundred rupees. So that was the only way of, you know, we acknowledging and helping. And the collection grew into eight hundred folk paintings and sculptures. And uh, about thirty, thirty-five years ago, I ran into somebody in uh, the craft museum who was a little different. He was a Godna artist. Godna means tattoo. So Madhubani is normally very coloured, but this is totally black and white. Was started mainly by women, but when they began to sell a bit, then the men also took over and to get the skin colour out on this coated on paper. So I started buying his work and saying, "Pandey ji, you have ancient trees, but now just you have to copy me and take it." And I would say, uh, "Make a Delhi ke trees are the traffic lights, so we made traffic light and we made it sprouting leaves." Or a traffic signal suffocating the trees. So a series came out of that. It was shown 30 years ago, and we co-signed. So it was the first time I think as a temporary a folk folk artist co-signed because we were four travellers in the same boat. Right. He in an unlit village, me in the capital of the city. The show was called Between Dualities. Dualities have always fascinated you. Yeah, I, light I and day, light and darkness, red light and death, light and death, and so violence and peace. Now I want to get back to it. Yes, I'm really 
quite overwhelmed. Yes, best interview of my life. <laughs> Ajit ji, I want to come back to you, Ajit Appa. Um, we've talked about partition, but you must tell us a little about how you try to build a bridge over the river of pain. And I'm thinking of the first uh, Indo-Pak Writers Conference that you held in Triveni for three days in 1987. The odds with which you fought, you know, there were tremendous odds that you had to contend with. You fought for nearly a year to obtain visas of different authors. Eight but it years. happened. Eight years. Eight years. Oh my God. Eight years. It all started with the fast up coming to her house to get my story and her painting for lotus. <coughs> you know, they get out this beautiful bag with uh, quarterly lotus from Beirut. He took eight of your paintings, isn't it? He was uh, living in exile mm. in Beirut, uh, escaping the uh, imprisonment. He then went to exile. <coughs> And he came to our house and we sat and talked and talked about, lamented about the poor state of things because no writers could legitimately uh, get visa and come to India. No writers <coughs> from India could legitimately get a visa. He said, even I couldn't come if I hadn't been in Beirut. From there I could get a visa. Had I been in Pakistan from Islamabad, I couldn't get a visa. Let us do something. I said, uh, what can I do? I don't know anybody in the government. I, his uh, book had been uh, uh, transcribed into Hindi by Shira Sandhu of Raj Kamal. I said, uh, you know Sheila Sandhu, she is a powerful woman. Her husband has been Sandhu, knows everybody in the government. Why don't you tell her? He said, look at this girl. She is a businesswoman. She won't do such a foolish thing. You are a writer, an emotional person, foolish and emotional. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> I said, Tessa, I start trying, but I am not sure. I have never been to any government office. I had never seen South Block, really. So uh, he left me with the idea for voting in my head. So it took me eight years to get 10 visas for uh, Pakistani writers. And I invited the countless writers like Amos Faraz, who was only next to Faisal. Unfortunately, Faisal had departed by that time. So next one was Amos Faraz. Amos Faraz is the Dalho Sahib. Mohammed Manchayad. All the best writers and uh, uh, Emma Nadeem Kasmi, who yeah. says he is my guru. I learned from him how to write stories. And top was writers, 10 of them came here. After lesson in Adama. And we had a concern. I had no money. Well, I didn't know I could get any money from anywhere. So I was doing it from my own pocket and I was talking. So we booked the wedding. There was 640 seats. I said, oh, fill it up. It ran to pack. It was packed on all the three days, I believe. Three days. Yeah. And I booked, uh, I went to GNU. Can you give me some rooms in the hostel? They said, no, we have a guest house opposite the wedding. Gomti guest house. 40 rupees a day. So I booked. Uh, and uh, for uh, lunch and dinner, natural seeds. <laughs> but around the corner, eat the uh, cheapest 
and the best. <laughs> so I thought I could afford it. So I booked all this and they came and people went mad. Jilani uh, Bano came from Hyderabad mm. to see them, meet them. People came from Allahabad, Lucknow, from all over Punjab. I said, I I don't know where to take you. You manage your own uh, 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 boarding and lodging. What? She's saying this, but her house was quite an adda for writers. <laughs> You're saying this, but your house was such an adda for writers. The Trivendi was overflowing with people. People sitting on the carpet, standing all over. And Sundari Shirindarani, the owner, he used to fight with me. My new carpet, <laughs> my new hall. Did you know it can accommodate so many people? How did you fight? I said, I didn't invite anybody. They have come, they have brought them. They want to see their Pakistani writers. They want to meet them. They have been reading them, have never seen them. They want to meet them, hug them. So I said, Sundri, this is a miracle which is happening. Even I didn't imagine it. And this miracle will never happen again in the It has never happened again in the yeah. That 10,000 people brought it. So I, uh, Arun, just one little link thing. Sorry, am I hegemonizing this conversation? Um, Coming back to you, Alpana. Uh, you recently, I think a couple of years ago, you were really excited. It was that epiphanic moment when you discovered a handwritten letter of hers. Yes. And you've been in touch with Sanjeev Hashmi anyway. She wrote. Yes, yes. In an old art book. Yeah. It says we had so many letters, but after being thrown out of our house uh, by our landlord, in eighty four, in uh, December, he threw out of our like we were uh, scattered on the road. So many papers, letters have been lost. But one letter she located in an art book, and his writing is superb. His uh, words are like they are resting on <coughs> wheelchairs. Wheelchairs. Is flat so beautiful. So Pansa was great. And then your then came your whole SARC initiative. Pardon? Your SARC, SARC initiative. SARC Writers Conferences. The first one was set up in 2000. And the, you did I uh, didn't 60 do it. In fact, the executive was Miller Shankar, uh, who was joint secretary SARC in the Ministry of External Affairs. She uh, invited me. She rang me up and said, uh, can you come to South Block? I said, I don't know where South Block is. <laughs> no, we have to talk to you about whatever you are doing with Pakistan can be done at a larger scale. I said, I don't know where South Block is. So she sent her uh, director named Bodane and he fetched me in Mira's car to South Block. We have said, let us do it in larger quarters involving all the South countries. I said, why don't you do it? You are government. I am a mere Aditya. She said, because you have been doing it with Pakistan, you know writers. <laughs> and the fact is it. We cannot do it because then they made SARS. They made the constitution. They forgot to include culture in that. It is only trade and let us eliminate each other's poverty. Each other's poverty, not our own. <laughs> <laughs> there were two agendas in the
The woman betrayed the poster of the film, you know, the documentary, which beach hunting in Arkhand area, which we shot. You gave the painting, and later Parthi Shah designed the poster. So, I just forget the name of the series. It's like a case of that woman with an agate bite. Was it the one where she, the mask is on her lips, and partly they are open? It was always like that. In the old days, now yeah. things have changed, but partly blocked and partly open. Yeah. I missed the question. Uh, I missed hearing the, the question. The name? Yes, yeah. you, you have a mic. You just repeat. He was asking for a name of a painting he recalled. Okay. She gave the painting for my film poster. I just forget the name of the painting. It's the series that Sujata was talking about, Hilary White and Tribal. Because the film was shot in Jharkhand or Bichhanti. If we don't have any questions from the floor, I have one which we might close with. And that is that both of you are in a, a fairly unique position. I was saying both of them are in a fairly unique position of having inhabited a cultural landscape and actually having gotten your feet and your hands dirty with the business of culture, um, the currency it might hold, the currency that it has lost. And so my question to you is that uh, what is the before and after to your mind? Very good for the situation. I think this is a very good end. He may be still pretty here. He may be 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 Bound for uh, bre bre breaching, you know, there were uh, there were breaches in the embankment of Satluj River. So for that cause, I think I, I read in the newspaper <laughs> that you donated a huge amount. And I know that from, from my own social causes, whenever I've spoken to you, you've been most generous. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. This has been an honor and pleasure of a deeply moving conversation, and we are very, very grateful to both mother and daughter for being here and for. So much work has gone in and the way you know so much about us. I need to write about it. Thank you. Thank you.